God almighty, does this place look like a DOS house? Get out! <laughs> Stole this, did you? Give me my drink! All right, all right, keep your ear on what you've got. Here. Where'd you get this if you didn't come by it, dishonest? I earned it! Doing what? Look in this basket. So? Someone steal your laundry, did they? <laughs> Wait! <laughs> Wait. Antamanta jantar. Antamanta jantar. Jadu jantar! Hell <laughs> fire! Where'd that thing come from? Does it bite? Well, go on, then. How? Oh. Magic. Indian magic. The Crooked Man by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Dramatised for radio by Bert Cools. With Clive Medicine as Sherlock Holmes and Michael Williams as Dr John Watson and featuring Brian Blessed as Henry Wood. The Crooked Man. Perfectly all right, Murphy. Stop fussing. <laughs> Carry on with the story, Colonel. Oh, you must be sick of it after all these years. Don't be so modest, sir. Very well. Here you are, Colonel. Good man, Major. What do the damn doctors know, anyway? <laughs> now, where the devil was I? Oh, yes, yes. So, there we were. Shut up in Bertie. Supplies and ammunition practically gone. The regiment, half a battery of artillery, a company of Sikhs. Damn fine men, too. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of civilians and women folk. Rebels all round us. Here, here, here. General Neal's column was here, off to the north and heading up country. We had to get a message to them. But to do that, we needed definite information about the rebel placements. So... I disguised myself and went out to spy out the lie of the land and I found that there was a safe path here. And the entire camp was saved. <laughs> <laughs> a thousand lives, gentlemen. But there was one person there that mattered more than all the others. Gentlemen, a toast. <laughs> the first lady of the Royal Mallows, Mrs. Nancy Barclay. Mrs. Nancy Barclay. James, I'm sorry to disturb you. Nonsense, my dear. Just routine business. Besides, how could your presence ever be an intrusion? Thank you, James. I'm going now. What is it tonight? The Guild of St. George cast off clothing for the needy. You're a credit to the regiment, my dear. Ronald Murphy used exactly those words to me today. You know what they say about the silver tongues of the Irish? Well, in this instance, he's absolutely right. A credit to the regiment and a credit to me. You won't be late back? Oh, no. Nine o'clock at the latest. Good, good. I like you to be here. James, it is our Christian duty to look to those less fortunate than ourselves. Blessed are the poor, the good book says. Now I must go, and Morrison will be wondering where I am. Nancy? Yes, James? Don't be gone too long. Put your hand on the table. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> now I cover it with this box. Now what? 
<laughs> Do you feel any pain? Shake it out, for God's sake! Do you feel any pain? No! As I told you. No. Do not move your hand. How could I? <laughs> Shumantar! <laughs> thank you, Shukri. Thank you, thank you. Yes? Uh, you asked me to tell you when Madam got home, sir. I I'm to bring her some tea in the morning room. Would you like some? The morning room? Uh, uh, Colonel. What is it, Jane? Sir, it's not my place, but uh, Mrs Barclay... Well, she doesn't look very well, sir. Uh, get the tea, Jane. I'll go and see if she's all right. Not to deny it. Give me his name. I'm warning you. Don't touch me. Keep your fist hands to yourself. Oh, don't Dad? take that away from me. Colonel Barkley, oh, sir. sake, woman. Pity. <gasps> what do you know of pity all these years? Peter. Oh, oh Peter. You Come here. Listen, man. Listen. You're nothing but a sniveling coward. It's a what? Keep away from me. Colonel Barkley. Mum. The servants will hear you. I want them to hear. Oh, I want everybody to hear. Mr. Holmes, it's good of you to come. Major Ronald Murphy, temporarily in command of the Royal Mallows. Major Murphy, my colleague, Dr. John Watson. Doctor. Late of the 5th Northumberland Fusiliers, and latterly the 66th Barkshires, Afghanistan. The 66th? You were at my want. Field surgeon. Oh. Pleased to meet you, Doctor. Major. Mr. Holmes, Doctor, this is a matter of the utmost delicacy. Yes, so you said in your telegram, information of a more positive variety was distinctly lacking. You must understand my position. I know only that some tragedy has overtaken the commanding officer of your regiment and that someone close to the Royal Mallows is implicated. Wrongly so, in your opinion. Beyond these obvious facts, I know nothing. My telegram contained none of those details? I have no details. If what you've just said is already public it knowledge... It is not. Then how could you possibly know? Major, Holmes can read a good deal where others see only blank pages. Mm. A combination of the tone of your message and your words and behaviour this morning. Major Murphy, we are wasting time. I am making every effort to understand your attitude, but I cannot work beneath a military cloak of secrecy. It is essential that this dreadful business be cleared up entirely within the Mallows. I'm sure that Mr. Holmes understands you wish to avoid any sort of scandal. Unfortunately, the police are already involved. Colonel Barclay's coachman sent for them when he discovered his master's body. At last, a concrete fact. Colonel Barclay is dead. Yes, Mr. Holmes. And the police believe he was murdered by his wife. He'll be greatly missed. He was a fine soldier. Much decorated, I understand. Oh, yes, indeed. His career was covered in glory. The Crimea, the mutiny, any number of times since. When was his body discovered? Yesterday evening at his villa, he had been struck on the back of the head with a heavy carved club, Indian rosewood. Yeah, that is remarkably specific. The club was found next to the murdered man. Ah. Why does suspicion fall on Mrs. Barkley? The police have no definite evidence against her. That was not what the doctor asked. Major Murphy. At the time of the tragedy, Mrs. Barclay was alone with her husband behind locked doors. The staff heard them. There was evidence of a certain disagreement. Disagreement? A uh, quiet discussion, uh, a heated exchange, a blazing row, what? Mr. Holmes, the Colonel and his lady were the very model of a married couple. Their family life was uniformly happy. Until last night. Major, what are your grounds for declaring that Mrs. Barclay is innocent? Simply that it is 
frankly impossible that she could be guilty. Oh. Huh. If Mrs. Barclay is innocent, what is your explanation of the man's death? I have no explanation, Mr. Holmes. That is why you are here. What is the lady's account of the matter? She has made none. Indeed. Why not? Because she is incapable of doing so. When the coachman found the colonel's body, he also found Nancy Barclay totally insensible. She has not yet regained consciousness. Uh, stay there, if you please. Now, the body was found here by the hearth. That's correct, Mr. Now, Major Murphy, please, Watson. The least disturbance of the room could be damaging, Major. Of course. I'm sorry. But uh, a good few people have come and gone since last night. I do not need to be told that. Vital evidence has been trampled forever. Now, please, no more talking. Now, the Colonel lay here, feet against the armchair, head near the fender. There's traces of blood still visible. Mrs. Barclay was found on the sofa. Yes, insensible. <laughs> well, well, fascinating. The coachman came into the room by the French windows, yes. He stopped there, saw the bodies, turned... Now, why didn't the coachman cross to the door and unlock it? Uh, that would have been the quickest route for summoning help. Perhaps he didn't want the female servants to see the colonel's body. Mm. Or he could well have been in shock and not acting rationally. No, actually, Doctor, there was a simpler explanation. Which, which was? Uh, you can come in now. There was no key in the door. Ah. Who had it, the colonel or his wife? Neither. But then where was it found? And it wasn't. The police eventually forced the lock. OK. Major, be good enough to tell the staff. I'd like to speak to them. Hmm. Yeah, what is the household? Yeah, only the two, Jane Stewart, the maid who admitted us, and Peter Johnson, the coachman. Only two servants? Mrs Barclay is proud of the fact that she runs the house herself. She does not believe that menial work is degrading in the eyes of God. Indeed. She has strong faith. She is a most devoted Christian soul. Much of her time is given to charitable work. That is one of the reasons why this accusation is so ridiculous. Even angels have been known to fall from grace. Not Nance. Not Mrs. Barclay. Well, I'll call the staff. Yeah, another room must be made available. I don't want to talk to them in here. Very well. Ah, now, Watson. Mm. Wouldn't it Major Murphy's duties as Barclay's second-in-command have brought him into frequent contact with the Colonel's wife? Fairly frequent, yes. Mm. You remarked, of course, that he started to call her Nancy and then corrected himself. Quite. And his insistence on her innocence does fly in the face of all the evidence. Mm, so I thought. Now that I've seen the room, yeah, I have to disagree. You do? Yes, unless you can explain why this singular lady, having clubbed her husband to death in front of the fireplace, proceeded to take a stroll around the room before collapsing onto a couch some 17 feet away. You're sure that's where she was? Mm, yes, yes, quite sure. The coachman will confirm it. Uh, one more thing before we proceed. Ah. What? At a stroke of luck, the police arrived by the same route used by the coachman along this gravel path that runs round from the front of the house. They never stepped onto the lawn. And you found something? The faintest of traces. But enough, Watson. Enough. Sufficient to... Hmm? Yes. Sufficient to let me separate the relevant and the irrelevant from the mess in here. And what is the relevant? The footprints of the third person who was present when the colonel was killed. David. She said the name David. You could swear to that. Yes, sir. It, it was perfectly clear over and over. David. Mm. Does your mistress know anyone by that name? Not so far as I know, sir. If she does, he's certainly never been to the house. Mm. Are there many regular visitors, Johnson? Hardly any, sir. Apart from Miss Morrison. And she is? Miss Anne Morrison, Madam's closest friend. She lives in the next villa. I believe they went out together last night. That's right, sir. Indeed. Uh, the Colonel was clearly a lover of weaponry. That's Turkish, 16th century. 17th. 
Uh, was the carved club found near the body part of this collection? I'd never seen it before, sir. Nor me. Very good. So, when Mrs. Barclay returned last night in such uncharacteristic heat, it was shortly after leaving the company of her closest friend. Hmm. Any more questions, Doctor? No, I don't believe so. Is there anything else you want to tell us, either of you? Any detail could be of importance. Uh, yes, there was something, Doctor. Go on, Johnston. Well, sir, the Colonel's face, his expression. What about his expression? Oh, it, it was terrible to look on it, sir. A look of pain? Surprise? Oh, no, sir. It was fear. Fear and horror. The Major's waiting for us out in the drive. Mm-hmm. Good. Have you found any more traces? Mm, a few. I believe that this case is considerably more complex than first appeared. Did Nancy Barclay beat her husband to death? At eight o'clock, she was happy and contented by 9.15. Hmm. What could have caused so complete a change in such a short space of time? Hmm. I've been thinking about Major Murphy. Hmm? You were suggesting earlier that there may have been some romantic connection between him and Mrs. Barclay. If there was, and the Colonel had discovered it that evening... And confronted his wife with his knowledge. Hmm. No, 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 it doesn't fit. She was already upset before he joined her in the morning room. No, but the theory's a good one. Perhaps if we simply reverse it. You mean the Colonel was having an illicit affair? Yes, and his wife found out about it. But how could she have done so? Well, you'll recall that she wasn't alone on her little outing last night. And I believe that the next-door neighbour holds the key that will unlock this mystery. Nancy Barclay learned it from her. Hmm. But how in the world could she have known? What, sir? Oh, come on. The Colonel was conducting an affair with his wife's closest friend. Do you deny the possibility? Oh, no, I suppose not. And I imagine it's possible that this Miss Morrison could have confessed out of guilt. But can you prove it? And how does all this tie in with the third person who was there when Barclay died? After I've spoken to the lady, I hope to have the answer to both of those questions. I'll meet you back at the barracks in two hours. You're going to see her alone? Yes, I think it might be productive for us to separate. Very well. What are my orders? Oh, Watson, this place is having an unhealthy influence on you. Mm -hmm. What I'm requesting you to do is gather information about the Barclays, the Colonel in particular. Certainly. <laughs> As to produce an expression of frozen horror on the face of a man with his reputation for bravery yeah. is a remarkable feat. To know what horrifies a man, we must first know the man himself. Well, of course. He started off as a private. He was in the ranks and in the mellows. Mm. He rose from private to commanding officer in the same regiment. That's a rare feat. He was a rare soldier. He missed. Certainly will. You know, when I was in the Barchers, our CO was a strange case. Damn fine man and all that, but he had a few quirks, I can tell you. <laughs> Don't they all? He, he used to sing when he was on parade. Sing? Oh, only to himself. Hymns, mostly. Barclay used to go into trances. What, like a sort of fake ear? I saw it happen once at a regimental dinner. One minute he was you know, laughing and joking, going over some battle or other. The next, he just wasn't there. As if the smile had been plucked from his lips by an invisible hand, like magic. <laughs> and a manta gentle. Do you feel any pain? <laughs> <laughs> what? What's the joke? Miss Morrison, you knew the Barclays well, I understand. Your understanding is incorrect. Oh. Well, I was told that you were a frequent visitor to the house. One may visit a house, Mr Holmes, and not be equally familiar with all its inhabitants. Well, I can scarcely imagine the Colonel being unaware of your presence. I hardly ever saw him. You, but you can surely tell me something of his character. Nothing that you cannot learn in more detail elsewhere. No, perhaps not, but a, a woman's point of view is always valuable. Uh, Colonel Barclay has been described to me as a gallant old soldier, a fighter, a man among men. Nothing has been said of his attitude to the fair sex. I cannot help you. No, oh, surely you can. Did he enjoy the, the, the company of women? Had he formed any particular friendships? Hmm? Among his wife's acquaintances, perhaps? That, sir, is a highly improper question. Miss Morrison, this is a most serious business. Propriety must give way to honesty. Mr Holmes, had you known Colonel Barclay even as little as I, you would not have needed to ask that question. And why not? Because the late Colonel was scarcely capable even of recognising the existence of another woman. It is my belief that James Barclay was devoted to his wife to a degree that bordered on the unnatural. Tell me about Mrs Barclay. Mr Holmes, I've already been through all of this with the local police. But not with me. 
You and she were both at the meeting of the Guild of St George last night. Yes. Hmm. Was there any period, however brief, when you were not in each other's company? No, sir, there was not. Well, then my final question assumes a vital importance. Nancy Barclay left her home last night a happy and relaxed woman. She returned nervous, upset and overwrought. What happened, Miss Morrison? What happened to cause such a change? Nothing, Mr Holmes. Nothing happened at all. Magnificent. Doesn't the organisation of the army appeal to you, at least? The precision, the discipline. I see only a mindless machine whose components are trained to blind obedience. Holmes, that's an outrageous slur on a magnificent institution. She's lying. And Morrison? She has to be lying. You mean she did have a romantic liaison with Colonel Buck? No, no, no. She was clearly telling the truth about that. Now she's concealing what happened when the two women were together. I must speak to her again. Mm. What about your mysterious intruder? Shouldn't we be looking for him? Uh, as mysterious is the word. Uh, he's a singular individual. And his companion, even more so. His companion? There were two men. No, no. What, what do you make of this? I traced that from the floor of the morning room while I was waiting for you earlier. Hmm. The paw print of a dog. Not a dog. The general shape's right. But this animal ran straight up one of the curtains. Hmm? Ever heard of a dog doing that? Hmm. It's not the foot of a monkey. It's no creature that I'm familiar with. Why in the world did it climb the curtain? It was trying to get at the canary. Oh. oh it's carnivorous, whatever it is. Hmm. Each new step we take throws up something bizarre. Oh, my dear fellow, forgive me. I haven't asked after your own researches. Were they productive? Puzzling, certainly. Mm. Well, you can tell me all on the way back to the secretive, Miss Morrison. Ah, sir. you want me to accompany you this time? If you would. It's not only in matters military that you enjoy unique insights. Gentlemen, I cannot. Miss Morrison, you must. Nancy begged me, made me swear by all I hold sacred, that I would reveal it to no one. And such a promise should not lightly be broken. But the circumstances have changed so much. If Nancy Barclay were able, I'm sure that she would speak in her own defence. Since she cannot, you are the only person who can. What you say makes good sense. Yeah, perhaps it would make things easier for you if I were to state the broad outlines of what happened. Are you able to do so? How? At some time, during the 75 minutes you were together, a man approached and spoke to Nancy Barclay. <laughs> He was dressed strangely in a loose garment of poor, rough cloth and was possibly carrying a box or basket of wicker. His appearance must have been, uh, well, let us say, unusual. He was lame in one leg and walked with a stick and he was, I believe, a man of extremely small stature. You're mistaken. He was a man of normal height, or had been once. <sighs> well, then his injuries must have been severe indeed. His back was twisted as one might wring out a cloth to dry it. He was bent almost double. He had a fearsome face, very dark. His skin was all crinkled and puckered like a withered apple, and his eyes... There was a gleam in his eyes that came back to me in my dreams. He was dressed in rags, but the clothes were Indian. When he took Nancy aside and spoke to her, just for a second, I heard his voice. It was awful to listen to. He was the most hideously deformed man I have ever seen. When she saw him, Nancy turned as white as death. Did you hear what he said to her? No. I called out that I would fetch the police. But Nancy shook her head. They stood together, and the wretch waved his fists in the air as if he were mad with rage. And then he went away. Nancy could hardly speak, but she begged me. I have betrayed my most solemn word. You have saved the life of your friend. You're looking remarkably thoughtful, Watson. But then, a lady in distress always brings out the reflective side of your nature. Presumably, this deformed man was the intruder at the Barclays Villa. Quite. And you deduced his appearance from traces at the murder site. Oh, that's remarkable. Thank you. Though I wish you'd told me slightly earlier. Well, I have to admit that several of my details were little more than speculation until they were confirmed by Miss Morrison. You mean to say you bluffed her into telling us what happened? What if you'd been wrong? But I wasn't. 
And now we have to track down this singular individual. Well, I believe I can be of some assistance. Of course you can, my dear chef. I mean, in a quite specific sense. Listen to this. He was bent almost double, and his face was like something out of hell. He was dressed in Indian gear, all tattered and filthy. Sound familiar? Good God, who are you quoting? My two drinking companions in the officer's club. They were talking about a sort of beggar magician they'd seen here in the town. I didn't mention it before because I didn't think it was relevant. Perhaps in future you'll confide in me a little more. My dear fellow, never doubt it. <laughs> Must find out where this man before. In a public house called the Musket and Shot. Here's the address. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, you fulfil my hopes. The doctor clearly does not exaggerate your abilities. I was in that room, and much nearer the time of the murder. I saw what you saw, and yet... You I... saw, I observed, a crucial difference, Major Murphy. Yeah, but this praise is premature. We gather our cards only slowly, and we do not yet hold a full hand. Well, surely we know a great deal. This evil-looking creature accosted Mrs. Barclay in the street, followed her home, broke into the villa, and clubbed James Barclay to death. Yes, but why? The interest of this affair lies in the motive, not the crime itself. All I ask is that you clear Mrs. Barclay. Find this villain, Mr. Holmes. You shall have as many of my troops as you need to track him down. Thank you, but I hardly believe that the massed forces of the Royal Mallows need be mustered. <laughs> Go away! Leave me alone! Who are you? What do you want? We've come about the death of Colonel James Barclay. Uh, what should I know about that? How can you better have a fire when the weather's so warm? I feel the cold. Uh, keep away from me! Not until you've explained yourself. You've been following Mrs. Barclay. What? have threatened her in the presence of a witness. No! Last night, you went to her home where you came to blows with her husband who died at your hand. Yes, she lied! Oh, Mrs. Barclay lies in hospital with the police at her bedside, ready to arrest her for murder the moment she comes to her senses. Oh, my God! Is it true? Swear that this is the truth! Swear! It is the truth. Nancy! She's innocent. She's innocent. And you are guilty. No, I am not. Then who killed Colonel James Barclay? <gasps> it was a just providence that killed him. His own guilty conscience struck him down. What are the Colonel to be guilty about? Look at me, if you can bear to. Am I answer enough? <laughs> See that I am not. Oh, very well. I'll tell you the story. I don't know why I shouldn't, for I've no cause to be ashamed of it. Not me. Are you in pain? I have lived in pain and walked in pain and known nothing but pain for 30 years. Have you been examined by a doctor? <laughs> Where I've been, there are no doctors for my sort. You see me now with my back like a camel and my ribs all awry. But there was a time when Henry Wood... Thirty years or more ago, I was in India with the Royal Mallows. You were in the army? And in Colonel Barclay's regiment? We were stationed in a place called Porti. They weren't just soldiers. The camp was like a village. Children, wives, daughters. Uh, the colour sergeant was called Devoy. He had a daughter, Nancy. Uh, Nancy Barclay, she is now. What on earth did she do to you that you persecute her still? You don't know what you're talking about! <laughs> Here. <laughs> Nancy Devoy was beautiful and kind and gentle. The finest girl that ever held the breath of life between her lips. Everybody loved her, but there was only one man she loved. She used to say he was the handsomest man in the regiment. Barclay was a sergeant then, but already marked for the sword belt. I was just a lad. And then the mutiny broke out and all hell was loose. Before we knew what was happening, he was shut up in Boutique, hemmed in. 
There were 10,000 rebels all around us, and as keen as a set of terriers at a rat cage. They knew they didn't have to lift a finger. They knew we couldn't last forever. It was a waiting game. Mm, water would have been a crucial factor. How long did it last? Until the middle of the second week. And then we only had one hope. General Neil's column was moving up country. Someone had to go out under cover of darkness and reach them and bring back help. There was a call for a volunteer. Sergeant James Barclay. No! I did it. You volunteered? Is that so difficult to believe? <laughs> Yes, I suppose it is. But I had my reasons. All oh, my reason. Barclay knew the ground better than any other man. He drew me up a map that would take me safely through the enemy lines. Ah. Now then, the old riverbed. And then west. I do not believe What's you'll that? be needing your map. Oh, oh, Good. Oh, oh, Bring him. Oh, oh. They trussed me up and, and dragged me to their camp. They thought I was out cold, but I was made of stronger stuff back then. I was planning how I could escape and finish my mission and save all the people who were depending on me. But then... I heard something that turned my heart to stone. Naksha hai tumhare paas? Ye bahut acha. Apni wadi ka pakka aadmi hai Sergeant Barkley. Barkley betrayed you to the enemy. Yeah. As soon as I volunteered, he must have got word of the plan out to the rebels and then he sent me straight into their hands. It's incredible. For God's sake, why? Can't you guess? Because of Nancy. Nancy? By God. It was you she loved. Not Barclay at all. Me, Corporal Henry Wood. For my good look, she loved me. The handsomest man in the regiment. And with you out of the way. What was to stop him? He had an education. He had her father's approval. But surely he also had every expectation of dying in the siege and the lady with him. Disposing of the one man who could bring help is hardly a rational act, rival or no. Oh, he knew what he was doing. General Neal's men relieved Bertie the very next day. So they must have been coming there anyway. And Barclay must have known it. Found out the news on one of his famous spying trips to the rebel camp, but he kept it to himself. And God alone knows how, but he even managed to take the credit for it. Mm. The start of his rise through the ranks to commanding officer. Yes. When Neil's men arrived, there was a terrible battle. Only a handful of the rebels got away into the hills, but they dragged me along with them. I was their slave. Ah! Uh, oh! Ah! Uh, you like my country, Englishman? Uh, oh, yeah. You uh, like the way it tastes, huh? Uh, oh, no! Look at it. So uh, fine. So uh, brave. Uh, you! You stretch out his arms. Uh, if you're going to kill me, get on with it. <laughs> kill you? I'm not going to kill you. Killing is much too noble. You shall not die. You shall simply wish to do so. I remember the sounds most. The knife blade slicing through the muscles. The hissing as the blood steamed in the cold air, the cracking as the bone snapped, and the tree they hung me on creaking gently under my weight. The thuggy torture. I've seen other cases of the same sort, but never... Never so bad, eh? No. Did they finally let you go? Ah, that's not their way. They were attacked by hill people, and I managed to escape. I had to go north. Into Afghanistan? It was many a long year before I saw a white face again. I lived among the natives and the beggars, and picked up a living by the tricks I had learned. Indian magic. Did you not think of revenge against Barclay? I burned for it. <laughs> 
<laughs> but all fires die in the end. What was the use? I'd rather that Nancy should think of Henry Wood as having died with a straight back than see him a wretched cripple, a crooked beast, crawling with a stick. Well, in that case, why did you come back to this country at all? When you get old, you have a longing for home. Eventually, I managed to save enough to get me on a boat. But why did you come here, to Aldershot? I just wanted to be where there were soldiers. I didn't know the regiment was here until I saw her. Oh, yeah. I wish to God it had never happened, but it did. And she knew me. It's not possible. No, don't look at me for pity's sake. No, don't turn away. Please, Henry. Here. The touch of her hands. After all these long years, and her eyes... I thought you had been dead these thirty years. I have been. They told me you were dead. He told me. Nancy. Henry, what happened? Who did this to you? No! Tell me. Uh, it all came pouring out. Thirty years of hate. And Mrs. Barclay went straight home to confront her husband. You followed her across the lawn and watched the two of them through the French window. He raised his hand to her, his filthy hand, thick with my blood. I couldn't stop myself. <laughs> At the sight of me, he looked as I have never seen a man look before. <laughs> I read death on his face. His head split open on the fender, but he was dead before he fell. The bare sight of me was like a bullet through his guilty heart. Nancy! Oh, oh my dear love. Mrs. Barclay! <laughs> I didn't know what to do. I took the key from her hand. I was going to unlock the door and let them in. But then I thought how it would look. And so, instead, you ran away, having first recaptured your little pet. He escaped when I dropped his basket, Teddy. Hmm. A mongoose. What a beautiful creature. Yeah, my partner is Teddy. I got him back in here and was off as fast as I could move. Leaving behind your carved stick. The police believe it to be the murder weapon. They truly think that my Nancy killed him? They do. Well, sir, I am ready to come with you to the police or the regiment if that's what must be done. Wait. I now believe the official case against Mrs. Barclay will scarcely stand close examination. The inquest alone should leave no doubt as to the cause of death, assuming your reading of what happens correct, Watson. Yes, I think it could well be. You remember the coachman's testimony? The vivid contortion of the features is a common sign of failure of the heart. What are you saying? Uh, if Mrs. Barclay should prove to be in serious trouble, we'll have to come to you again. But otherwise... I see no object in raking up this scandal against a dead man, however foully he acted. Unless, of course, you want the satisfaction of seeing the truth brought out. Once I would have gone to any lengths. Not any more. Then I believe there is no more to say. Watson, wait for me outside, would you? Of course. Well, sir... My regiment was over there. The country never really lets you leave, does it? You never forget it. Once you breathe the air of India, it stays in your lungs for life, they say. Yes. I believe you are mistaken about Nancy Barclay. What? What do you mean? Easy, Wood. Something you said. For my good looks, she loved me. I had nothing else to offer. I'm going to give you some advice. As one ex-soldier to another? No, as a man to a man. Well? Go and see her. Be there when she comes to. Like this? Last night, she was too shocked to see me properly. A second time, she'll find me 
repulsive. I do not believe so. I think you misjudge both the lady and yourself. Will you take my advice? Perhaps. Very well. Good day to you, Corporal Boyd. I believe I managed to convince Major Murphy that all will be well and the honor of the regiment is secure. You shouldn't sneer at such things, you know. They're important. Tradition, reputation, honor. What about the honor of the late Colonel? There is one thing. Mm -hmm. The Colonel's name was James, or Wood was Henry. And Major Murphy's name is Ronald. All right, so I was wrong about that. But what was all that business about David? Well, if I'm right, that one word should have told me the whole story, if I really was the ideal reasoner you're so fond of depicting. The whole story? Yeah. When coupled to the lady's deep religious faith and knowledge of the good book, as it was, it only came to me rather too late. Uh, my biblical knowledge is a trifle rusty, I fear. Well, I purchased this on the station. Yeah. David. I believe it was a term of reproach. Of reproach? Yes. Ah, here we are. Ah, yes. Yes, yes. I'm quite correct. The story of David and Bathsheba. Uh, David strayed a little now and then, you know, and on one occasion in the same direction as Sergeant James Barclay. Hmm. David and Bathsheba. And Uriah the Hittite. Wasn't he Bathsheba's husband? Oh, very good. Very good, Watson. Yes. Yeah. King David ordered Uriah into battle, wait, yes, into the forefront of the hottest battle, that he may be smitten and die. Ah, yes, yes. And the wife of Uriah mourned for her husband, and when the morning was past, David fetched her to his house, and she became his wife. Second book of Samuel, chapter 11. Don't disturb me before we reach Waterloo. This is a good fellow. The verdict of the inquest on Major James Barclay was that death was due to apoplexy, aggravated by the weakened condition of his heart. He was mourned by his regiment and fellow officers as a fine commander, a good and generous man, and a noble soldier. The investigation into his death was abandoned, and when Nancy Barclay eventually returned to consciousness, there were no police officers at her bedside. I never discovered whether or not Henry Wood acted upon my advice. In The Crooked Man, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Medicine and Dr. Watson by Michael Williams with Brian Blessed as Henry Wood. Colonel Barclay was played by Terence Edmund, Major Murphy by James Green, Nancy Barclay by Anne Windsor, Anne Morrison by Christabel Dilks, Jane by Joanna Myers, the barman and the first officer by Andrew Wincott, Peter and the second officer by Nigel Carrington, and the Indian rebel by Amajit Dew. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The violinist was Leonard Friedman. The Crooked Man was dramatized for radio by Bert Cools and directed by Patrick Rayner. <laughs>